Hello friends, welcome to Knitography. I'm Patricia and I'm coming to you from my studio on my little farm in the middle of Norway. It is a Monday afternoon after school and look at this daylight that we have. When I come home from school now, my studio is flooded with the most energizing natural light possible. So I'm very encouraged to have the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you at the beginning of the week. I'm behind on recording from the weekend because this is my weekend that I worked on the co-op farm and did my bit for reimbursement for maintaining my sheep there. So it was a very busy weekend and I had uh, to do lots of mucking up. It was rewarding and fulfilling and I had a great weekend. I came home uh, to work on my own farm 
uh, late in the evening so it was busy but I have a lot to share with you and I just didn't want another week to go by uh, before I checked in about the fairy tale mitten trunk show uh, I have some things to talk with you about I have some topics from questions and so I'm really happy to be here today I haven't really talked a lot about the Edinburgh Yarn Festival as I had hoped by now you've probably seen lots of people uh, sharing uh, impressions and reflections on the Edinburgh Yarn Festival. I had a wonderful, wonderful time, but it was a very emotional and overwhelming experience for me, so it took me a while to really come down from it. Yeah, to get myself together. It sounds very strange. But uh, it was an opportunity for me to once again to be together with some people that I really care a lot about and spend some quality time with them. A reunion uh, from Rhinebeck, if you will. And it was also an opportunity for me to meet some of the people that have inspired me in my journey as a maker. It was also, uh, most importantly, the opportunity for me to share the story of my farm, to share my dream of, of getting my wool out into the world, getting my sheep here on the farm, delivering my blockers uh, in person, and also to allow people to uh, try my bee butter, which I make here on the farm. Yes, it was just overwhelming and incredible for me. So it really did take me a while to absorb coming back and reflect on it all. I just needed some time. But I want to say a most just heartwarming thank you to everyone that came up to me and said hello to me if you were a viewer of the vlog. The most interactions that I had from viewers was about the knitting bag book. That was such an emotional experience for me for people to come up and talk with me about the knitting bag book. I also received 12 knitting bag books. I just, I cannot thank you enough if you shared a knitting bag book with me. I have uh, ordered them in the order that people gave them to me. When I open up my project bag, I'll show you the one that I am using now. And I just want to tell you that meant everything to me. To know that some tool that I have used really, as I've said many times, to save my own life and to heal myself is being used by other people means everything to me. And I really appreciate to know that it has made a difference uh, in your life. So I did have the opportunity, as I said, to uh, deliver my blockers, to exhibit my wool with many makers, and that was so encouraging. But I also uh, felt so encouraged that people that had the possibility uh, to see my wool were so pleasantly uh, surprised by the quality of it. Um, I received so much beautiful feedback that it was soft, that it had a beautiful luster and sheen, that it was round and plump, and that just meant everything to me. I, I have done all of the prep of my fiber myself from the sheep all the way to the skein. For people to share that kind of feedback with me, it just meant everything. I think that maybe people were thinking that this would be extremely rustic because it's a heritage uh, breed that we're trying to uh, bring back to a larger population. I think they might thought thought it would have been coarse and um, yeah not as lovely as it is now this is from my 2016 clip and I did receive a lot of tutelage 
in this process but my 2017 clip that I uh, have sent away now uh, to be spun uh, that is completely my own prep so I sorted and washed and scoured and did everything myself but this one of course I received a lot of um, support and and uh, I learned a lot from this process but I think they are of equal quality as you know this is what I'm working for. I really want my farm to uh, produce the three gray colors from the Grotrendersau, the light gray, the medium gray, and then this rich, dark, uh, chocolatey gray in the future. So I'm a long way off, but I, I will continue to share my story and get the word out and I will be working hard and keep uh, trying to uh, share my blockers. These are my sock blockers. Um, for those of you that might be new uh, to my vlog, I hand make these from Norwegian birch trees here on my farm. Uh, my family, the four of us, work together to fell the trees uh, to maintain our forest uh, every single year. And I work with a local mill just down the mountain around the bend. And they create the... Um, the plates that I then take and uh, laser cut. The, the laser uh, cutting is also done here on the farm. And then I hand sand them uh, with a three uh, sanding process each piece. And then I polish them and uh, with my own bee butter. So they are a beautiful result. I love this one because look at the grain of the wood. This one is actually uh, in the process and has not been polished yet, but you can see uh, the natural birch wood. And again, you see the whatever, whatever is coming right from the tree, you'll find it uh, within the blocker. But I make mitten blockers and I also make sock blockers. And uh, it is quite a production. I do it all by hand. And uh, so yeah, it was wonderful uh, to deliver those things in person at EYF. I'll talk more about EYF and the people that I met as I share things with you. I plan on sharing things along um, in the vlog as we go along. But today I really want to continue the fairy tale mitten trunk show. I have a giveaway um, for you at the very end. I have a collaboration with my friend Lori that I want to talk about. And I want to talk about mitten cuffs today. I want to talk about mitten charts. And this is a result of some of the questions that I have. Uh, received. I hope to get to sharing a couple of books with you. So I want to get started uh, right off with the fairy tale mitten trunk show. And just to add, if I don't get everything up in this vlog, uh, I plan to record a part two again uh, during this week. But I want to make sure that I keep this uh, manageable with time that I have. So I'm very excited to share with you the next mitten in the fairy tale mitten trunk show. And as I shared a little a teaser on Instagram, this week is the fairy tale leaf mitten. And it is on page uh, 41. I have to put on my glasses so that I can see properly. And it is based on a Norwegian Cinderella story. So I really encourage you to go and uh, read this story. You can actually read it in English on Wikipedia. Now, I could not find a... Um, a regular picture book or anything to go with this, but it's fascinating to read. It's unlike any Cinderella story I have ever read. There are trolls, there's an adventure, there is the evil stepmother, there's her father, and there there is 
the the prints and the shoe and everything what happens is is that this Cinderella uh, when she is on her way to find the prince, she must go through these different forests. She must go through a copper forest, she must go through a silver forest, and she must go through a gold forest. And when she's in there, she has to be super careful not to wake up the troll. And the troll has a different number of heads. I think in the gold golden forest, he had he was a nine-headed troll, so it's terrifying. But Anyway, this uh, designer, Mayfried Engset, she is Silke Sewen on Instagram. She has designed this mitten uh, to represent the uh, leaves, the golden leaves that hang down in the forest. She's made a delicate, a beautiful, delicate, uh, yeah, I guess we could call it a Cinderella cuff. She's made the branches, and these are meant to represent the dripping leaves in the forest. Now, what's really special about this pattern is that not only do you get uh, this design, but in the pattern, you get several options to put together the mitten you would like. Like here is a one where you've only got the one leaf and the pattern. Then here is one where you've got the branches with the leaves. And then here is a chart where you've got the leaves that would be dripping all over the forest. So you get really several mitten patterns in one pattern. Now I only have uh, two examples of this mitten. I have this one, which is the golden uh, leaf. It's the same pattern as this one. But in the picture within the Eventyr Volter book, you see that the Voltologa has knitted uh, all of the varieties of the mitten. Once again, this mitten is laid out exactly like all of the other patterns. You've got the title Eventyr Leaf or Fairy Tale Leaf. You've got the name of the designer, Mayfried. I think she goes by Frida. And you've got um, Silke Sauen, her uh, website. And then she gives you uh, the little clip from the fairy tale that inspired her. And hers was when they went through the golden forest and it said that the leaves were dripping from the trees and the branches and so on. And the name of the fairy tale, if you want to look it up, is Kari Tereastok or Kari Wooden Cloak. And so she wore a, a cape made of wood. And you, when you read the story, you'll understand that. So it says in this, in this, uh, in the beginning of it, it says in this pattern, you can have leaves growing in all kinds of colors. She talks about all the different patterns that you can have. She talks about the, the gusset of the thumb is like the selbu vaulted. And this is a very good example uh, of practicing this, the, uh, the selbu gusset if you're new to it. So there's not a lot of other things going on so you can really focus focus on learning uh, the gusset. She talks about the sizes. She talks about the different yarns that you can use. This one is in Hifa Ask. She talks about, um, actually this one is knit in a uh, rosy green wool, which is uh, actually a superwash wool. She talks about the gauge again. She talks about the needle size. She talks about the number of stitches that you're going to have on the cuff and the number of stitches that you're going to have in the mitten. And then if you turn the page, once again, as with all the patterns, there is the, um, there is the sizing, the mall, the lengths. Now, then she goes in and talks about the cuff. So with this cuff, you're going to cast on 48 stitches 
and you're going to need a stitch marker and you are going to knit this garter uh rue le Conte, the garter border you see that it's here so you're going to do a garter stitch border three times and that means that will be six rounds and then after that you're going to follow this little chart here to create this beautiful uh, cuff and here you see that you've got your ret maske, which is the knit stitch and you've got a new word that we haven't translated yet called a cost and a cost is a yarn over and I like to think of the word cost as cast like you're casting a fishing pole. So when you see the word cost, you know that it's a yarn over like a fishing pole. That's just how I learned it. Then you've got your purl stitch and you've got your knit, uh, knit two together or you've got your slip slip knit, you know, the slanting ones that are uniform within all of the patterns. So you know if you're going to decrease to the right or decrease to the left. And then here she just uh, types it out in Norwegian. She talks about, uh, that she gives the chart in words. But for us speaking English, you're just going to follow the chart here right across. You've got a knit, you've got a cost or a yarn over, knit, knit, knit. You've got your decrease, you've got your purl stitch, you've got your decrease, you've got knit, 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 and you've got a yarn over. And then the next row you see is a plain knit and then it is a purl stitch. It talks about, the next part talks about that it does have a thumb gusset and you're going to treat the thumb gusset as you would any selbu uh, vaulted and you just follow the chart there. You're going to follow the diagram for the thumb and you're going to decrease the top like a selbu mitten. So you're just going to put together which chart you would like to knit. If you're just going to have the one golden leaf or if you're going to have the branch down the middle with the whole branch of golden leaves, or if you're going to uh, cover the mitten with golden leaves hang dripping down like in the story. So this is a very clever pattern in that you get three patterns in one, three different choices. Now all of the thumb gussets are the same. So all of those uh, look the same. You've got the little leaf hilsen and you've got the back of the thumb that looks, that coordinates with the, with the mitten. So what was very interesting about this Eventure leaf mitten is that the Voltologa did a little gauge experiment together. And you'll see the picture here uh, in the book each one of the eight Voltologa knit this mitten pattern. They could choose any of the motifs that they wanted to knit, but the criteria was that they would all knit with the same yarn and with the same needle size. And if you see on my Instagram feed, you will see the mittens lined up to show the differences that they came up with with gauge. Like this uh, mitten is quite small. You'll see it is the smallest one uh, in the photo. So that was a very interesting uh, experiment that they did to show that every knitter has their own gauge and that it is important that you choose the needle size that is right for you with the yarn that you're using. I want to talk a little bit about cuffs before I move on to the next mitten. I've had a lot of questions about cuffs uh, since people have begun uh, knitting the fairy tale mittens and I often have a lot of questions about cuffs with the selbu vaulted. But I want you to remember that in the selbu vaulted book, one of the things that is inside this book that shows us that there are different parts to the mitten. They spend a lot of time just talking about the cuff. 
and then they spend a lot of time talking about thumbs and then they spend a lot of time talking about patterns on the hand the palm patterns and then they spend a lot of time talking about the uh, overflotta or the top of the mitten so mittens have their own parts and I think what's really confusing if you don't know the history of the Selbuvaltered or the Norwegian traditional mittens is that you think you're you're knitting the cuff and so then the cuff you know just moves right into the body and that's not really the case the cuff of a mitten is its own entity within the mitten so you're knitting the cuff and as in the Eventyr Walter book you know every time we've talked about the mittens there has been the cuff and you've knitted the cuff and when you were finished with the cuff you need to rethink what you're going to do with the body of the mitten and what I mean by that is you've got your cuff stitches and you've got your cuff pattern and then you're finished with the cuff. I want you to know that sometimes when you move into the body of the mitten, you might need to increase before you move into the body of the mitten. You are going to start out with 48 stitches for this mitten, but you're going to need to increase up to 58 stitches for the body of the mitten. So the cuff is its own pattern and has its own stitch count and then you move to the body of the mitten and it has its own stitch count. And you need to prepare and increase before you're ready to knit the body of the mitten. The other thing that you need to know is that once you're finished with the cuff, you've got to redistribute your stitches to have them placed on the needles with the palm stitches on one side and the top of the mitten on the other side. Now, if you're doing magic loop, that means that one needle is going to hold the palm stitches and the thumb gusset. The other needle is going to hold the front of the mitten. And I'm just going to show you a little bit on a Selbuvaltered uh, pattern here because here I'm finished with the cuff and here are my palm stitches and then you've always got this kind of middle thing usually for a Selbuvaltered, the side and I keep my palm, my gus thumb gusset and my side stitches on one needle and then on the other needle I keep the front and the other side. So I've had a lot of questions about not understanding what do you do about the cuff. Oh, it doesn't add up. It's, uh, you know, it's so many stitch. It was like this on the cuff. Once you're finished with the cuff, don't think about the cuff anymore. Redistribute your stitches so that you can have the palm of your mitten and the thumb gusset on one side and your the top of your mitten on the other side. Now, this one has not been blocked properly and you can see how I did it. I had the palm stitches, my gusset, and these side stitches on one needle. I always use DPNs with my cuff and then I usually uh, switch to Magic Loop. And then on the other needle, I had the front of my mitten and this side on the other needle. So I've had a lot of questions about that and I want you to know that if you use DPNs, then needle, for example, if you're starting here, needle one and needle two are going to hold these. You can just divide them in half and needle three and needle four are going to hold the front of your mitten. So. Just remember that when you're finished with the cuff, you're finished and you need to redistribute 
your stitches for the body of the mitten. And the palm side is going to have a lot less stitches than the front side. So you might have 32 stitches on the front, but you're going to have very few stitches on the back on your palm side until you get up here and you've increased in your thumb gusset. Now, if it's not a thumb gusset, you'll probably have the normal amount of stitches on the front and back if it's an anatomical. Oops, I, I when I was working on the farm, I injured myself, so that doesn't look very nice raking and mucking out barns, so I really, my hands are not very nice today. <coughs> so, I hope that explains it a little bit and that you really look at your charts separately. Look at your cuff chart or your cuff directions, finish your cuff, and then follow your mitten chart as it is written. The other question that I've had is about the charts. Now, we're very lucky with the Eventyr Vaulted book because they have provided the right hand mitten and they have provided the left hand mitten chart. So you don't have to do a lot of thinking where that's concerned. So you know here you've got for example this is the left hand mitten chart for one of the mittens and then you turn the page and you've got the mirrored right hand mitten. Now if you're knitting Sebu Walter traditionally there is not a right and a left hand mitten. So if you're using the Sebu Walter book you will find that you just get one pattern and that's it. Now I learned to knit mittens without the two charts and I don't know if this will help you. I don't know if I explain it correctly but I'm going to tell you what I learned. I also am going to give you a tip. I know there are some apps that will flip the charts or mirror the charts for you. Try to research some of the apps. I think one is called Knit Companion. I think if you put your PDF in, you can flip and rotate your charts so that you can mirror your pattern. The other thing you can do is you can take a photo of your chart and you can put that photo, I think, in like PowerPoint and you can flip and rotate. You can also take it down to a copier and I, I do if it's a very intricate chart and I need it blown up, I'll go down and get it blown up and then I might just mirror it just to save myself time because it's intricate. There's lots of ways you can mirror your charts, but what I want to say is what I learned and I, I hope this will be clear because it really is working in my mind, maybe more than I'm able to articulate. But if you notice here on this mitten, if I'm starting with the palm and I go across the palm and then I've got to knit the top of the mitten, if I know the palm is first and then I knit the top of the mitten. I know that on the other mitten, I've got to knit the top first and then the palm. So that's really how I do it. If you notice on the child's mitten, this is the right mitten. So here's one. I'm knitting across the palm and then the front of the mitten. And then on the left mitten, I'm going to start across the top and then I'm going to knit across the palm. So that's what I do. You're just going to reverse what you did before. Wherever you started on the palm, the next mitten, you start on the front. And that's really how I learned it. I hope that helps you and does not confuse you. So, the next fairy tale mitten, I decided that I was going to do a couple of them in the vlog, so I hope that's not too much. If you feel that it's too much, let me know. But this one is one of my favorites. Why? Because I am an early childhood specialist, and this book is called The Little, it's like Little Kid Goat, Little Baby Goat that could count to 10. And this 
book is a story by Alf Preysen. If you remember in earlier vlogs, I told you about the green mitten. Alf Preysen wrote that story. Oh, he's a treasure in Norway, really. But this little, this is little baby goat and he's learning to count to 10. This book is completely Norwegian. The illustrator is Norwegian. She's got woodcuts and, and this looks like watercolors. It's a gorgeous book. I just want to show you some of the beautiful uh, colors within the book. So Little Goat, he's actually looking at his reflection and he just, he starts to count himself and then and then the uh, the little the little calf wonders what he's doing, and he counts him, and he doesn't like that. They don't like to be counted. And then the mama cow comes over and wonders what he's doing, uh, and he tells him he's counting, and so he counts one, two, three, and then it progresses on. None of the animals like to be counted. They get quite cross uh, to be counted. And it moves along and they go to the ox or the bull and uh, they're running away. He's running away because Mama, Mama Cow is after him. And then he counts himself again and he just keeps counting and none of them like it. The, the bull doesn't like it and they just start chasing him and so on. And it goes through all of the little animals in the book. There's a horse. He doesn't like to be counted either. You see here, they just keep going on and he's counted one, two, three, four, five, and and they just get crosser and crosser at him for being counted. And they meet the pig, but he doesn't like to be counted either. And they all start chasing him. And this is actually my favorite page in the book. This is such a beautiful picture. Here they all go and so on. And then they come to the harbor, uh, to this boat, and on the boat is a cat and a sheep and the rooster and the dog. And they all get on, but the rooster is really worried about what's going on because the boat can only count have 10, 10 on the boat. So he asks, who can count to 10? And so on, and, co and so Little Goat could do that. He could count to ten, and he counts and makes sure everything is going to be all right so that the boat doesn't sink. And it's really nice because the, the rooster says, hurry and count! And he does count, and on this page he does all the counting of the animals. And there they are all on the boat. Isn't that beautiful colors? It's so inviting. In the end, the little goat, he gets a job at the harbor. And uh, so now when the passengers come, he counts them all and makes sure that it's safe on the boat. And he makes sure that there's only 10 passengers. So I love this story. Like I said last week with Billy Goat Scruff, I mean, the children are just uh, thinking it's so funny whenever the, the animals are chasing or they're getting cross or anything. But this story really is about kind of being different, having knowledge that other people don't have. I mean, have you ever felt that way? Like, you have some knowledge, but you're a little different. I mean, we can feel that way in public as knitters. There's a lot to say about this, being the underdog. and I felt like all the animals in the book really, they didn't understand what he was doing. It's about being misunderstood and... Yeah, but in the end, of course, they appreciated his knowledge because it could keep them all safe and so on. But anyway... I like to get a little bit deep with the stories as a grow as a grown up. I teach in a very unique curriculum which is not just superficial and I try to question the children in this way. So but anyway, these are such clever mittens. I say that every one of them is my favorite, but I just love this mitten. All of the animals are on the mittens and all of the numbers. So You've got one, you've got two, you've got, it's so fun to find them. You've got three, four, you've got five, 
you've got six, and what's really fun is you've got seven in the body of one of the animals, you've got eight, nine, and my favorite bit of all, you've got ten on the thumbs. So this is such a lovely pattern. The pattern is designed by Ann Mita or Pinaguti. I know that you've heard of her. She has many popular uh, designs. She's a prolific designer. I'll show you in the book. It's really worth going and putting her name into Ravelry to see her designs. Um, she has so many, so, so, so many beautiful designs. And so here in the book, you see here are the original mittens. Now this is Tor, uh, Tori Seyerstad. This is not Pinaguri, but this is Tori uh, wearing the mittens. And she love, looks like she loves them as much as I do. And again, you've got the little goat, which could count to ten. You've got Ann Muta. Pinaguri, and her blog is called With Needles, Med Pinid. And then she says, Alf Presen's Eventud on the little, uh, the little uh, goat that could count to ten has found its way on two mittens. All the animals are there. All the numbers are there. And then she says maybe it's the perfect mittens for an early childhood teacher, which I think it is. So uh, the size is ladies medium. Um, she talks about the yarn that is there. She's got some in here from Selbu Spinnery, which is my local mill. Um, she talks about the needle size. And again, she talks about the cuff with 52 stitches and then the body is 60. So there is a difference between the cuff. She's got the um, length and she talks about the how to knit the cuff. You're going to cast on 52 uh, stitches. You're going to knit uh, two uh, knits and two purls. You're going to have a stitch marker at the beginning. And then you're just going to put some stripes in. And if I know Ann Mira, you could, she would love creative. You could do this any way you wanted to, actually. So she's one of the designers that really likes um, people that take the design and mix it up and be creative. She does a lot of knit-alongs where she does mashups, and she likes to see creativity in, in her pieces. So you could just make this cuff any way you wanted to. So she talks about how to knit this one if you like it exactly. And then, uh, and then in this one, you're changing uh, to a bigger needle size after the cuff. So let's see. She says you start with a 2.25 millimeter. That's the recommendation. And then she goes up to a 2.75. Now this one actually doesn't have a uh, traditional thumb gusset. This one has a more, um, it is on the back like the Selbu, but this one is more like the afterthought thumb or, yeah, so you'd probably put this on waist yarn. She does say that you're going to put it on waist yarn and that's what I did. So on the charts, you can see all the animals and all the numbers. With thicker yarn and needles, you can adjust it to bigger hands or smaller hands. She talks a little bit about uh, the variation, and you see here's the here's a child wearing them. If you want to knit a smaller pair for a child, there's not a specific uh, child uh, pattern here, but you would just adjust your needle size and your yarn. So this is a wonderful, wonderful uh, pair of mittens for a child that's learning to count, or if you know a teacher, or yeah, if you just like the story yourself. All the animals that the little goat counted. I think that's my favorite part is the number 10. Of course, it's one, zero, one. You could do it like that, but oh, I love these mittens so much.
I think it's really nice using the black as the contrast and then changing uh, the color of the background because then you get a really, you, you need a strong contrast uh, to knit these uh, lovely fairy tale mittens. This book is not in English. It's not yeah, this is 100% Norwegian. So any kind of uh, book that has the traditional uh, farm animals, I think, would uh, be wonderful for this mitten. So that is the trunk show for this week. Before I end this week's vlog, I want to show you a couple of things because I am having a giveaway. I am going to be giving away one of my friend Jill's... Look at her knitting bag. She made me this uh, as a gift for EYF. I'm going to be giving one that you can choose from her shop. The fabric that you like. They're so well made. She's Birdie and Poppet. Let's see if I can get that to focus. Yeah, there we go. Birdie and Poppet on Etsy. And I'm going to give away one of her bags. I'm also going to be giving away some of my friend Lori's soap in the giveaway. And what I wanted to say at the end, Lori and I have a collaboration. We have thought about, you know, I have my blockers. It's very important to me that we take care of the planet and things are natural and Lori and I have had lots of conversations about this with wool wash and Lori has made a forest wool wash. You can purchase this wool wash um, through Chickenwood Studio. This is one of her soaps but that's her logo. Lori's soaps are holistic, they're natural, they're gentle, they're full of essential oils. This one is fantastic. And uh, what I really wanted Lori to also have are her lotion bars for your knitting bag. So Lori creates these lotion bars and they're organic, coconut oil, beeswax, shea butter, essential oils of orange, lavender, frankincense, and cedar wood. And you just keep pop it in your knitting bag and the heat of your hand warms up and they're just, it just turns into lotion. They are just so soothing when you're knitting, you know, after you write in your knitting bag book and you just soothe your hands. I just keep this one right in my uh, knitting bag. So Lori, in connection with the idea of my blockers, has created this wool wash that is earth friendly and is natural and helps to replace the natural lanolin into your wool. It smells like the forest. If you're interested, I encourage you to go to Chickenwood Studios, her website, or contact her on Instagram. You can contact me and I will get you in contact with Lori. But I'm going to be giving away one of Jill Birdie and Poppet's bags. I want to give away some of Lori's soap and I want to share uh, some of Pia Camabornian's buttons that she gave me as giveaways. I also wanted to show you Pia's book because on my next vlog I'm going to really be sharing Pia's picnic book with you. Now this book is in Swedish. But this is a beautiful book. I have just been treasuring it. After Pia and I did the mitten project together, uh, I helped her with the English translation. She sent me a copy of her book. This, the photography in this book is absolutely stunning. And what's really lovely is Pia has shared some of her recipes in here. So this is a really lovely book and I just want to show you some of the photos and go through the book and talk with you about that. I'm really excited about recording again to talk a little bit about my knitting because I finished my Telia jumper. I did share it on Instagram. I finished it 
it's conditioned, it's let low be, fits perfectly. I blocked it, I conditioned it with a, a hair conditioner. I washed it in, in the wool wash, the gentle wool wash which restores the, the natural lanolins. I conditioned it and it's just, you know, I don't have any problem with let low be. I just encourage you to condition it, make sure that it soaks for yeah, 25 to 30 minutes. What I do is I get my lukewarm water and then I rub my wool wash soap into the water for that gentle cleaning. And then after I've cleaned it, I, I pour that water off and then I just start to squeeze the piece. And then I fill it up again with some wool wash for a set. I mean, let lopi is quite dirty. I wash it again and then I make sure that the water is really fat with hair conditioner. I put enough hair conditioner in there to make sure that the water is super fat. You know, it feels greasy on my skin, the water. And then I soak it in there for half an hour. And it is just as soft and light. The only thing is I'm not happy with the cuffs. So I am going to be... I don't know. What I did was is I kept the collar in the chocolate brown color and I'm super happy with that. I love the pop of blue, but I knit the sleeves first and I hadn't really decided about the collar, but I'm just not happy. I might I might, you know, cut stick it right back and just have nothing on the cuff. I haven't really decided, but I am going to change the cuffs. I have a lot more knitting to talk about and a lot more on my list, but I think I'm going to record again, get this vlog up. It's getting a little bit chilly now and late in the evening. Uh, so it's been lovely to visit with you today. I hope that the information about the fairy tale mittens and cuffs and charts was helpful to you. I want to say finally that the Evan Tervolter book is completely sold out. We've sold out of it. So if you're getting inspired, uh, maybe you're new to the vlog and you're thinking, oh, I want to knit those mittens, please go to the down bar of this video and you can purchase the ebooks directly from the Votologa. There are two ebooks. One is Mittens from the Fairy Forest, and the other one is More Mittens from the Fairy Forest, and those have been translated into English. This book is in completely in Norwegian. All of the translations, except for cost, that we learned today uh, is on my blog. And remember to think of the word cast as if you are casting a uh, fishing pole. It's spelled exactly the same except for the le letter K. You can buy those ebooks and join in uh, with the knitting. Please do tag me if you are knitting the mittens. I would love to see them. If you finish a pair, uh, make sure you uh, tag it with the year of the mitten. We have some beautiful uh, sponsors coming up for the month of April. I have an amazing sponsor uh, for the month of April, April prizes for the mitten. So make sure you get your mittens posted on Instagram. Instagram with the hashtag. I'm going to have a giveaway, as I said, uh, Birdie and Poppet, Chickenwood Studios, and a little uh, something from the Camabornia podcast. Uh, until part two, friends, enjoy your knitting and uh, do connect with me on Instagram if you have any questions or if you need support in any way. See you next time.